In the beginning parts of the 20th century, the little town of Mercersburg, Pennsylvania was abuzz with comings and goings of many of its citizens. Merchants moving goods, farmers moving cattle to the train station, wagons and horses moving up and down the streets. Things have changed over the years. New technology, new commerce opportunities due to the railroad, but something never quite changed. The local hotel and bar that's set on the southwest corner of the square. This hotel stood the test of time and has seen many people from near and far and from all walks of life and celebrity. This is the old mansion house. Though President James Buchanan once spoke from its balcony, the most famous person that probably walked these halls may have been the hotel's hostler and local stagecoach driver, Mr. Arnold Brooks. A tall, strong, fearless, good-natured African-American fellow, Arnold Brooks worked in the stables out back, tending to the horses of visitors to this little town and the nearby college, but would also walk the halls of the hotel, performing his duties to the hotel customers. But in the early 20th century, all that was left of Arnold's presence was his portrait, painted in oil, that hung over the door of the hotel office. Or was it? In the early years of the 19th century, Benjamin and Sally Brooks migrated from the South to arrive here in Pennsylvania. African American and born into slavery, Benjamin and Sally were illiterate, but were known to be industrious and had training in necessary skills. It is unknown if Benjamin and Sally Brooks were runaway slaves or they earned their freedom in some other way. Either way, they ended up here in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. They had five or six children, history's not 100% sure, but one was Arnold Brooks, who grew up in Mercersburg among the large black population of the area. Arnold was born March 17, 1809. Though little is known about Arnold's childhood, we do know that his education was very limited and he was trained to be a skilled hunter, for he was a crack shot in his older days. In fact, he purchased the rifle on August 17, 1848 from S. Shilito and Son for $10.25. Arnold also learned to tend and drive horses, a skill that was necessary in those horse and buggy days. It was the time of the creation of Marshall College in which Arnold gained his prominence. Marshall College, a religious school and predecessor to what is now called the Mercersburg Academy, was opened in 1836 here on Linden Avenue uh, in Mercersburg, which is the reason why we have such large houses on Linden Avenue to accommodate the college. By this time, Arnold was working at taking care of horses in the local area. Arnold was hired by Colonel Murphy, who owned the local hotel on the square, to take care of the customer's horses and the horses the hotel rented to visitors. Arnold also operated the stagecoach that brought travelers into town from the train station at Greencastle, since Mercersburg in those days had no train tracks coming into town. These travelers included professors at the college, students, parents, and other high-ranking individuals and officers who found a need to travel to the little town of Mercersburg. The black hostler eventually ended up with a family. He had a wife and three children, Charles, Samuel, and Cassie. Reverend Dr. Theodore Appel, first president of Mercersburg College that replaced Marshall College, reflected 
Arnold Brooks, a tall, muscular Negro, full of talk, afraid of nothing by day or night, was chief coachman who could drive his coach full of students into or out of town according to the most approved rules. He was a hero, much admired by the students as well as by his brethren. Reverend Dr. Benjamin Busman also described Brooks. Colonel Murphy's cozy hotel was crowded with strangers from near and from far. Brooks, his tall, faithful Negro hostler, haw hauled with broadest grin as friend after friend handed his horse and carriage over to him. Everybody that came to commencement in a private conveyance learned to know Brooks. Although his patrons saw him but once a year, he being a sort of doorkeeper, not only to Colonel Murphy's stables, but on commencement day to all of Mercersburg. Everybody made him show his snow white teeth with a hearty salutation, how are you Brooks? Commencement week was Brooks harvest season and well he knew and well he deserved it. Arnold often called a silver dollar a wheel. So friends and patrons that requested his services at the hotel or aboard the stagecoach and were so kind to provide this old hostler with a tip were called wheelmen. If they tipped big with a whole silver dollar, they were referred to as wheelmen. If they tipped half that, they were half wheelmen. If they tipped a quarter of a dollar, they were a quarter wheelmen. If those, or for those who tipped in lower amounts, it's unknown what Arnold might have called them. Probably nothing good. The young boys of the college that eventually became the modern Mercersburg Academy, which is where I'm standing at right now, would call on Brooks for his services as they rented horses and wagons to travel for picnics to Mount Parnell with beautiful local ladies on their arms. As a stagecoach driver, Arnold transported many famous names, including President James Buchanan, Judge Black, United States Senator Thaddeus Stevens, and U.S. Assistant Secretary of War Thomas A. Scott, who was a railroad executive and fourth president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Thomas Scott and Arnold became very good friends. Arnold was involved in what is known as Scott's first effort at rapid transit before he became a robber baron and president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. In the early days of Thomas Scott's life, the future railroad king was working as a dry goods clerk in Mercersburg, for he was born and raised near Fort Loudon, which is just north of Mercersburg. Arnold oversaw the stables at Colonel Murphy's at that time. Arnold loved and cared deeply for his horses that he oversaw, but he also bragged about their speed. One day when Arnold was bragging up his horses, Scott interrupted him by saying, Brooks, I'll bet you five dollars that I can produce a pony that can pace faster than any horse that you have got in the stable can trot. Arnold agreed to the bet and the race was on. At the end of it, Scott came out victorious with his first triumph in rapid travel. Arnold was disappointed and when he told this story to the students of Mercersburg later in life, he would express his feelings by ending the story with, damn it, he took the money. That was the worst. Though Arnold was well-liked and was a celebrity of the town, he often struggled in life. In 1852, the sheriff seized his house for debt. He later purchased property here on Back Street in Mercersburg, known as California Street today. He lived at that location, which is right behind me here, that house right behind me. He lived there until his death. His son Charles was a rambunctious young man who had done time in the county jail in Chambersburg and was accused of stealing by a neighbor on at least one occasion. Arnold most likely had to pay bail money and other fees to keep his son out of trouble. In June 1863, as the Confederates invaded Pennsylvania during the Gettysburg Campaign, Arnold's other son, Samuel, was captured by the Confederates. Fearing that Samuel was sold into slavery, Arnold searched hard for his son, probably paying for help along the way. 
Luckily, a Mercersburg local spotted Samuel in the streets of Baltimore sometime afterward and brought Samuel back home. In his later days, Samuel Brooks would recount his capture to Mercersburg students about serving Confederate generals and colonels and even having a pistol drawn in his face by a Confederate captain who threatened to kill him deader than a doornail. A storyteller, much like his father before him. Financial troubles were common for poor Arnold Brooks. Despite taking $5 from Arnold in his younger years, the now wealthy Thomas A. Scott took pity on his friend from Mercersburg. On September the 11th, 1865, Scott sent Arnold a suit of clothes, according to measure sent with the hope that the selection will please you. In 1870, Scott's private secretary wrote, Mr. Scott desires me to send you $20, which you will please find enclosed. When Arnold was in troubled times, his kindness to his fellow man served him well, as he often received help from his friends. When Colonel Murphy and his family moved west, Arnold lost an employer and friends. However, they did not forget Arnold Brooks. The Colonel's son Cyrus Murphy wrote Arnold to tell him, I wish you were here to go along hunting. I have no doubt you could shoot some geese with that long gun of yours. If you come out, we will give you a lot of ground on which you can build a shanty in which you may live as long as yourself or family lives. If you get in trouble, let us hear from you, and we will do the best for you we can. They never forgot. Good old Arnold. Even though the Murphys moved west, Arnold continued his work as hostler at the Mansion House Hotel, which still bears the name Colonel Murphy's Mansion House, or now it's owned by the Stoner family, so it's Stoner's Mansion House, but still they keep the Colonel Murphy here. But he also continued as the stagecoach driver as well for the new management under Mr. Lowe. As the legendary man aged, his hair and beard grew white. As times changed and the railroad began to find its way into the countryside, the days of the stagecoach were over and Arnold retired from driving and was captured in a drawing by uh, Charles Stoner um, when he did about the last run of the stagecoach to town here. Still working as a hostler, however, here at the old mansion house, Arnold liked to tell stories that fed on the superstitions of the African-American community, especially the young men. He would tell how he would come back after he departed this world, and he would haunt the living according to how they treated him while he was alive. Maybe the folks that were classified lower than a quarter wheelman? Just before his death, a traveling artist came to town and painted Arnold Brooks's portrait. It was a unique painting of a unique man. Arnold was dashing in his coat and tie, but showed his age with his wrinkles, his white hair and beard, and his drooping face. The painting was hung above the hotel office door, which opened into the bar room here at the mansion house. This painting became the prized possession of the proprietor of the mansion house hotel. After a brief sickness, Arnold passed away on February 24th, 1873, but that isn't the end of the story. After his death, Arnold was buried in the lower part of the lot in which he lived, which is located here, near the Upper West Conakajig Presbyterian Church and just off California Street in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, most likely somewhere in the corner of uh, one of these corners of this lot right behind me. His grave is unmarked, most likely because he was impoverished. Buried with him is his wife and possibly a children, child or two. Though time has lost the exact spot of his grave, he was buried somewhere around here. Despite his kind-heartedness and positive demeanor, Arnold's legacy is now defined by his ghost. Due to his many discussions about coming back after death to haunt the living, many would not go to visit his grave as the sun sank behind the mountains to the west and twilight began to shine. So this area here was avoided a lot.
The many African American workers and patrons of the mansion house would avoid the stables on dark and stormy nights as weird sounds were heard around the horse dwellings other than the normal creaking hinges or the commonplace clanging of halter chains. Now, those stables would have been about where these buildings behind me are, which are now part of the uh, Orrstown Bank facility. But um, that would have been where the stables roughly would have been for the mansion house. Even many African Americans that were in the hotel swore that the eyes of Arnold's portrait followed them as they passed across the, the bar room. One day in the early parts of the 20th century, over 30 years after the death of Arnold Brooks, an African American while entering the office door spotted in a mirror that hung on the opposite wall of the portrait the movement of Arnold Brooks on the canvas as he traversed the painting surface from side to side. Ignoring the possibility that the opening of the door could have moved the mirror and caused the portrait's reflection to appear to move, the portrait had to come down to maintain business in the haunted hotel. The painting shortly disappeared from existence and was supposedly burned to rid this world of the ghostly spirit of Arnold Brooks. Unfortunately, the legend of Arnold Brooks has been lost as another century ticks by us as time continues to march on. No one knows who he is anymore. No one knows his story, his kindness, his fearlessness, his skills and warm smile that greeted so many and warmed the hearts of many a schoolboy has now been lost. Even his own grave is gone. Nothing more remains of Arnold Brooks, including his portrait. But his spirit lives on. Not his ghost, but his character. Everyone has that one person who they looked up to at school or found amusement with. A groundskeeper, a substitute teacher, a janitor. They are all Arnold Brooks. He was a large character in life and an even larger character in death. Revered by all and discussed for ages by the souls he touched the most. Much of the information I presented here today was recorded by Lynn Harbaugh, a boy from Mercersburg and a friend of Arnold's. Lynn describes Arnold by saying that he had the shortcomings and grievous faults common to our humanity it is scarcely necessary to affirm. But in the eyes of a boy 10 years of age who was assuming to see things in their correct proportions, who did not hesitate to render right judgments, Arnold Brooks was the ideal hostler, stage driver, philosopher, and friend. Lynn Harbaugh wrote a poem entitled, The Old Stage Coach Comes In, and I would like to recite it to you. As even now I pause and close mine eyes, the scenes of years are gone before me rise. The old stone tavern with its swinging sign, the crowd of boys along the curbstone line. The loafers too, in goodly numbers there, and all with eager and expectant air. The stagecoach running late with heavy load is heard with rumbling sound upon the road. Then down the village street the swaying light from mud-splashed lantern glimmers through the night. Anon with clattering hooves and horses come. The coach with ponderous swing and wheels a hum is drawn round the old town pump and post well with a nod of passengers and host. Down from the boot the driver steps with pride and hastens forward to his leader's side. He strokes the steaming flank, he pats the nose, and thus to all the four in turn he goes. Mine host, the traveler, loafers, boys and all, behold with pride this Jehu, lank and tall, and watch his every move with kindly looks, for he who brought the old coach in was Arnold Brooks. <laughs>